How far back does our friendship go? Oh, okay. okay. Hello, everyone. We're live now, and I've got the uh, pleasure here to have both Professor Bird and David Hancock uh, here, which is quite difficult, actually. They live very close, but it's, and they're long, long friends, much longer. The state's much, much further back than um, my history, with at least with David Hancock and recently with Professor Bird. I mean, David Hancock needs no longer introduction. Professor Bird uh, does need some introduction. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus from the University of McGill, uh, where also my son studied, by the way. So ah, it must be a good university. Great choice. Yeah, it's <laughs> great, great university. You know, it's a very, it's, as, as uh, many of you know, it's, uh, it's an excellent university. And um, he uh, did his PhD in 1978 in, um, in raptors, right, mm -hmm. uh, wildlife. And maybe, uh, Professor David Bird, can you tell us a little bit more as an introduction? About well, yourself. I basically ran a, a bird of prey center at uh, McDonald campus in McGill for uh, about 40 years and um, when I retired in August 2013 I moved out to Vancouver Island because of a, a number of reasons and um, but I studied birds of prey for about 45 years and I'm continuing to study them uh, by using drones. I'm actually um, working with other people to, uh, to use drones to peer into to nests and this, to count eggs, for example, in young and raptor nests, and to count seabirds and track birds and so on. And I'm also uh, heading up uh, Team uh, Canada J to promote that bird for the National Bird of Canada. Very good. So, I mean, um, it's interesting, uh, uh, Professor Bird, that you actually live very close to the Sydney nest. Yeah, it was just a piece of luck. And I mean, I, I, I'm actually very grateful. How did you do it? I was going to ask. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very grateful to both you and David for, uh, for bringing me in on it. And, uh, and uh, I've had a lot of fun with it. I've, I've enjoyed interacting with the people that show up to watch the nest, the local neighbors and other, right. other tourists that come in now. It's a very famous nest. And, um, and so uh, I've enjoyed it thoroughly and uh, continue to enjoy it now. Very good. So um, I've just got quite a few listeners here. One second, I'm just going to switch my So screen. just to set the yes. scene, he may live close, a mile directly or a bit more than that from the nest, but he's right in the middle of about five other nests. I mean, the, this is not a rare eagle in our area. There's five eagles within the same distance of his house. So uh, this happens to be the one that a lot of people have got involved right. in because of this very unique feature. Okay, sorry, I've just been looking at some people. They said, uh, mine is waiting for us a photo. Okay, so um, we are live. We, we seem to be fine with sound. If you don't get sound, just look at your, your, your YouTube window. There is a lever and you should just be able to pull the sound up. So hopefully that will work, okay? So um, I'm, I'm seeing that most of the sound is fine. So the comments are, uh, the comments are coming in. Well, let's start with the most important question straight away. My, my <laughs> well, my, both my David friends here. The most important uh, question, how do you think the hawk got there? Let's start with Professor Bird. <laughs> well, um, basically, uh, the, the very first thing that I thought mm -hmm. when David told me that there was a red-tailed hawk in this bald eagle's nest is I initially thought that the eagles had taken the nest away from a pair of red-tailed hawks that had either eggs or young and, and basically adopted them and then added their own eggs or whatever. But I very quickly dismissed that hypothesis because David told me that the eagles had control of this nest um, for 25 years and were there well before. And there's no way red-tailed hawks would take away a nest from bald eagles. The size differences and aggressiveness is just so different. And the, and the other big thing about taking it away is the eagles come back from their northern migration in the last few days of September or the first couple or three days, first week of October, and they hold that residency of that territory yes. right through until they lay their eggs in February or early March. So they're holding that, that mm -hmm. territory, that nest site against all other eagles. And of course, no red tail is going to come in and displace right. them. But David, you had a very interesting uh, hypothesis at the very beginning about I did. a red tailed hawk with a possible egg or two in the system. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we've had another example, like just due west of us here out of Sawasan, where people witnessed a red tailed hawk which frequently nests within two or three hundred meters, yards of a of an eagle nest, and they are always in constant turmoil. The, yeah. the red tail is diving at all the time. They hate Dying. each other. They just like each other. And the red tail has such a tiny 40, 44, 40, 50 inch wingspan, he can just outmaneuver generally yes. the eagle. So he gets away with diving at the eagle 
But every once in a while, and there's a lot of records of this, the eagle, after about the tenth barrel uh, dive at him, does a barrel roll, reaches up, and grabs sure. the red tail. Yep. And in the case that we know of, right, locally, the eagle carried the red tail struggling mm -hmm. back yep. to the nest, apparently killed it. There was a camera on the nest from the distance, but not looking down into the nest. Yep. And that red tail, which came back to the nest, presumably exuded an egg, mm -hmm. because something like 30 days later, Mm -hmm. or it was more longer than that, about 50 days, 60 days later, they actually witnessed a little tiny hot head peer over the edge of the nest. Yes. And it's since the pair, mm -hmm. which nested 300 yards away, were now dispersed because one of them was dead, mm -hmm. um, and they said the dead one had come to the nest, it's pretty right. likely the female yeah. exuded the egg in her death throes. And because the eagle at the same time was laying its eggs, it just laid the eggs. Yeah. That red tail egg was incorporated in, into, the, into the actual clutch of the eagles, and she simply sat on them all. And the, egg, the red tail, of course, hatches at about 42, 44 days, uh, or 28 to 32 days, I should say. And, the, and um, the eagles hatch at 35, 36, 37 days. So there was an overlap. And that's how we know this case, that the red tail was actually raised by the eagle. Except that you and I are now um, in complete agreement that that hypothesis doesn't really work. And I actually have taught reproductive physiology for birds uh, for many of my years as a prof, and I know for a fact that it's impossible, well, it's, I won't say impossible, but really, really difficult for a red-tailed hawk female to have two well-developed eggs in her oviduct at the same time. She might have one that's ready to lay and another one that's going to have a shell put on it, but that would not happen while a hawk was in the death rolls because we now know that there were originally two red-tailed hawk young right. in that nest. One has since disappeared. So I, and I think you agree with me, we can throw that hypothesis out the window. Exactly. After you and I, I think we're all standing on the edge of the, below this nest in, mm. in Sydney, and somebody came up and showed us. Yeah. Uh, a week earlier, or two weeks, three weeks earlier, there had been two yeah. little red tails clearly in the nest. One in the meantime had died when we got there and we've yeah. never seen it again. So to have two in the nest, they have to have yeah. arisen from some other kind of mechanism. And we're pretty certain what that, pretty likely, we have a, a hypothesis how that happened. And I think you and I are now in 100% agreement that this was probably a case of what's called non-lethal predation, whereby uh, one or two of those parent bald eagles raided a local red-tailed hawk nest. It could even be the one that's on territory in my backyard, essentially, or the one that's a little further down by the, um, the uh, airport way uh, on Pat Bay Highway. Um, and what they've probably done is, is brought back both those young, maybe even more, but uh, likely they, just, they, they either took them all at once or they went back twice and kept bringing them back. And the idea was, was to feed those little red-tailed hawk young to their own eaglets. But then, of course, uh, we do know that um, uh, these little red-tailed hawks were likely dumped into the nest, but I don't think they really knew what kind of danger they were in. I well, think that they, sure they and, and they, all they wanted to do was be fed, so they started begging like crazy to these, you know, in the nest. And the urge to, to feed young is very powerful in birds of prey. Um, it's, it's, um, you can take young from other birds of prey and put them underneath another species, and like, in other words, we call that fostering. Rehab people do that to help raise the young in a, in a more normal way than hand rearing them. Uh, we've done it uh, trying to re reintroduce um, captive bred endangered species and so on. So it's very powerful. So the hormonal urge to kill that hawk and feed it to its own young was overrode by a stronger hormonal urge to feed it because it was begging. And that is, uh, I think, the hypothesis that you and I agree on. Yeah. A absolutely. The, the big trigger, my, my feeling, is it, it wasn't just the begging. Yeah. It's got to be something else. Mm -hmm. And I and the reason it likely has to be something else is because every predatory bird has to be conditioned over millions of years to respond appropriately. When the first egg hatches and is being fed, now the second egg hatches. She can't be tearing the head off that second egg 
now new chick and feeding it to the first one. There's got to be some real big yeah. impediment yeah. to killing another predator, yeah. but yeah. not killing yeah. prey species. Uh, okay, okay, but le let me just intervene with some interesting questions here. Um, what, I mean, one of the uh, arguments against it, nobody is actually, nobody can confirm that they've actually seen any red-tailed hawks ever being brought into an eagle's nest. Is that correct? It's, I mean, you're still on a theory here. It hasn't actually been seen. That's not, it may not have been seen, but it already has been documented in the scientific yeah. literature. And what does, do, what, can you explain what you mean with documentation? Well, it means that uh, a fellow named Jim um, uh, Watson, I believe, um, and some colleagues out of uh, the Washington uh, Wildlife Department published a paper mm -hmm. in the Journal of Raptor Research on this very thing. They had actually witnessed red-tailed hawks being raised to fledging age by bald eagles in not one, not two, but three different cases. They also cited the case um, of one that was published the year before in Michigan, but there seems to be some debate about whether uh, the people who published that actually knew it was a red-tailed hawk or not. It might have been another species or whatever, but certainly if this has already been published in the scientific literature, um, it, as a matter of fact, it's probably, uh, it probably happens more frequently than we think it does. Yes, nevertheless, we have how many eagle cams? About 100 eagle cams in North America, would you say that's about correct? Well, as you know, we pioneered having eagle cams in, in, in 10, 11, 12 years ago now, and there have been a lot of people who've taken up the same thing. So we have a number of, of eagle cams, but compared to the 10,000, no, 25,000 pairs of eagles nesting in, in the, across the country, perhaps even more, um, that's a very tiny, tiny little percentage of them. But what we have seen, we do know that there are many, many prey species brought to the nest, usually by the male, because the female is guarding the small chicks, and at some point he leaves the food at the nest site, on the nest site, and the female takes it from him or picks it up and tears it apart and feeds it to the chicks. And on our cameras, Many, many times, the, the voles, the mice, the ducklings, the goslings that have been brought in as food have been left for a few seconds or a few minutes, and pretty soon you can see the head look up and the, the prey species is assessing the fact that, hey, I think this is a good moment to leave, and he runs off and jumps off the nest and, and is <laughs> gone. Now, it's very apparent from this that dozens commonly come into a nest in one nesting season of live prey that are not dead. So bringing in an eaglet, or a hawklet in this case, is just a logical okay. thing. They're not, and we okay. know they eat. We okay. know red tails eat okay. baby. We, we've got tons of really good questions coming in. I'm just going to sort a few questions uh, just to, I'm, I'm reading all the questions I'm going to take the question from Amanda first because it's directly related to the topic here, uh, to this question. The other question, of course, has to do with the behavior later of the, um, you know, of the, of, of, of the uh, uh, hawk. Is it going to behave like an eagle or is it ever going to change its behavior? But let's, let's go for that later. Let's take Amanda's question first because just two days ago I interviewed uh, Miles Brown and he was the first one who actually documented it really beautifully when he was a tree climber at that time. Um, I think it was an aspen tree, and it was incredible because you see the tree trunk was actually completely ruined by a beaver. It was just holding, the whole tree was just, uh, you know, holding and stuff. But he was really convinced that the, um, in, in his case, the, 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 um, the red-tailed hawk uh, act, acts as a parasitic bird, which means it, it lays it there. I know you're shaking your head, but... Well, he has no evidence, no... Yeah. And he didn't even... When I watched his film that okay. he made okay. while he gets into the nest, okay. and he's handing down the first eaglet to yes, the crew below to man it, then he hands down the second one, and now he says, mm -hmm. he says, well, went, and now I'm handing down the third one, but it's really a runt. Mm -hmm. It's very small. He doesn't even know whether it's a red tail on it. It Correct. Is, he, he, did, he, he didn't, didn't know. even know. But so he, he uh -huh. no, no. So the whole point is, not only did he not know it was a red tail, he certainly doesn't know how it got there. That's that's an obvious. So fact. What we're talking about here is, is egg dumping. 
Yes, right. egg, egg dumping, dumping is a is a uh, thing that you see in cowbirds and cuckoos and so on, right. and right. also by a number of duck species. Right. But birds of prey do not engage in egg dumping. There is no scientific evidence that I'm aware of ah, that birds of prey deliberately lay their eggs in the nest of another raptor species for it to be raised. Well, in. that is the key point. So you said there's never any case with raptors. Not that species, I'm aware of. Not you're aware of. Yeah. Okay, well, I but think commonly, I, commonly mm -hmm. in captivity, mm -hmm. you can give eggs of one species of raptor to another, and they raise them. Yeah. Is in addition okay. to what David was saying earlier, you can take the young from one species mm -hmm. of raptor, give it to another raptor yeah. in captivity, and they artificially re or they rear it by adopting it. So this is another whole area, but it's very accepted. They will mm -hmm. raise other raptors. And, and it's, it's very interesting because there was just a question about the osprey, of course who's also a raptor, do you think that if an osprey would have made it into the nest and, and survived, you know, brought into the nest, do you think it would have been possible for an eagle to, ra ra uh, to raise an osprey? Why not? Uh, even, more, so, even, 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 even more, more? so because sure. ospreys have a fish diet, there you go. just like bald eagles. And we also okay. know that bald okay. eagles uh, parasitize osprey species by ospreys okay. by stealing their fish after the osprey does all our work. I think we need to real, rule out two other hypotheses. Though. First of all, we know the, the little red tail did not fly there on its own. It was there as a downy chip. <laughs> so, so that it did not get there that way. And no. secondly, we can also rule out that somebody put the birds there because David has checked the tree. There's no climbing marks on it. It's a very busy neighborhood. And, uh, and so consequently, and, that, and, they, didn't oh, get no, there but, by any, they didn't get there by any other means other than those bald eagles bring okay. in there. But David, of course, is an expert in drones, and he does live nearby. So there's the possible that Dr. Burt actually <laughs> orchestrated the movement of a couple of Here red tails uh, or red tail eggs and moved them in there by a drone. Now, some of the people say it wasn't it wasn't a white it was it wasn't a, a human being. It was a Martian who did it. So these are two other theories that we can't totally rule out. You have such a great imagination. <laughs> and now we get to the it's interesting part of the discussion is, are there any ospreys or red hawks on Mars? This on Mars. <laughs> There's certainly lots of them in the area. It's not an impossibility to dump red tail hawk chicks with a drone. That is possible to do that, but that's not what happened here. Okay. Those eagles brought those red tail okay. hawk chicks there, and David and I, after perusing the scientific literature and talking to people, and based on our own knowledge, we are 100% convinced that those red tail hawks were put there by the bald eagles. Okay, well, this is also interesting, yet there is a biologist whose name I don't recall, maybe it was Kerry or so. Terry. Who, oh, who, Kerry, Kerry, yeah. Kerry, who, who, who uh, seems to be very credible, you know, and I really want us to peep, uh, people with different yeah, absolutely. opinions. Absolutely, we're talking about them. Kerry Finley. Yeah. That, yes, Kerry yeah, Finley. Kerry lives in the and air. Yet, yeah, and yet, he him. is completely convinced that uh, this, what you're saying is absolutely not the case. Yeah, well, Kerry Finley yes. is, a, a, is a, a, a great bird watcher, mm -hmm. and he's also a very well-known waterfowl expert. Exactly. He loves, he and, loves and bufflehead ducks. Yes, yes, exactly. And he's a whale, whale biologist mm -hmm. as yeah. well, so, so I, good I mean, man. I, I guess it's going to come down to uh, who, whose credibility you want to accept. Yeah. I mean, I've studied raptors for 45 years. Yeah. David studied bald eagles for almost all his life. Yeah, and Terry Finley is a duck yeah. guy. So I, I know with all due respect, I mean, uh, Professor Bird and, and, uh, and, and David Hancock, science doesn't care in the end about, about experience. It cares about the truth, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and, exactly. and that's what it's all about. It doesn't care whether I'm a doctor or whoever. Yeah. It cares only about facts, right? Yeah. And it could be someone on the street who has the right idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it could be a third idea. Okay? Yeah. Oh, and there may be a third. The science one. is also based on hypothetical deductive reasoning. Of and course I think it is, you, and that's why we love it. I think if you it. look at all the facts here, you it. have to accept yes. the fact that these, these yes. red-tailed hawks, the two of them, were brought there by the parents. Ah, here comes a question from Jackie. Is hunting small mammals an instinctive behavior of hawklings, or will he <laughs> need to learn by observation? Yeah. Very well, interesting question. I mean, certainly, um, uh, that's a very good question mm -hmm. to ask. I mean, yeah. the fact is, is that both bald eagles mm -hmm. and red-tailed hawks as a species are very, very opportunistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, red-tailed hawks, if you look at the, the dietary menu of red-tailed hawks in the scientific literature, they'll eat anything from dead stuff, carrion, to snakes, to mice, mm -hmm. uh, probably even insects and so on, and I'll bet even, even detritus along the shoreline mm -hmm. and so on. But that's not really a common place to find a red-tailed hawk sitting along a beach walking around. And this little guy here 
who's now left the nest has been seen walking around on the sand flats, poking <laughs> in among the seaweed. Here. That's very bald eagle. Because like, that's, that's the next point here, is that this little red-tailed hawk has survived in that nest mm -hmm. for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, there's plenty of food to go around, right. so he hasn't um, basically become dinner for one of the other eaglets. In other words, they're getting fed well. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and the other second thing is this little hawk mm -hmm. is suffering from a little big man complex. In other words, he thinks he's a bald eagle. It's called imprinting. I've studied this mm -hmm. in falcon species in the 1980s where you take the eggs and young of one falcon species and put them in the nest of the other one, right. and then the next year you give them a choice whether they mate with their foster parents mm -hmm. or their own kind. Mm -hmm. And 50% of the time, they make the wrong choice. The same thing's been seen in whooping cranes, for example, and sandhill cranes. So that little red-tailed hawk actually thinks it's a bald eagle. It didn't have a mirror to look at and say, oh, I I'm, I'm look different. It, all it saw were eaglets and bald eagles, and listen to them, it's totally imprinted on that species. And, and this is the good question just came in. Will Stephen, they call it Stephen Hawking's, they call that little bird Stephen Hawking, stay, <laughs> stay, uh, stay in the area after eagles leave. What do you think? Usually, mm -hmm. red tails mm -hmm. stay around the nest area for a month or five or six weeks. And then they go on, like eagles do, then they go on some kind of dispersion and migration. Most of them go on migration. We, but we have a lot of red tails that are going to stay be in this area all the time. What we don't know enough about is, is it the same eagles, uh, uh, red tails that stay here the whole year? We do know that all of a sudden we get lots of red tails mm -hmm. arriving. And it's possible that ours go farther north or go farther south or go east or no, they can't go west because it's the Pacific Ocean. But it's possible that our birds, even though we have red tails here all year round, mm -hmm. actually leave and go somewhere else and we get other people's yeah. red tails for the winter. That's very, that's very possible. Yeah, and we have two questions here related to this, and that's one probably that David Tanko can answer here. Um, you know, how, how come it actually survived? I mean, the, 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 the talents of the eagles are so powerful, uh, how could it possibly survive? And the other, um, the other question I'll get to in a second. Well, that, that's really a simple answer. Mm -hmm. Having been a falconer mm -hmm. from the age 11, mm -hmm. and trained hawks and had a, a, a thousand different hawks mm -hmm. sitting on my fist mm -hmm. and training them every yes. day, you realize what a hawk does is grab the branch. And so the bigger the hawk, the bigger the thing, he wraps his talons around and they wrap right around it. Right. And so on our cameras, our live cameras, we have seen Many, many, even small voles, microtus, the deer mouse, duckling, goslings of different sizes, heron chicks, many things mm -hmm. brought in live. And we've seen many of them yeah. then a few minutes later run off the nest, perfectly capable of leaving and saying, I've had enough of this, goodbye, I got a moment to leave and I do. The big difference here is that the birds with the hook beak like their fellow eaglet sitting in the nest or a red-tailed hawk somehow aren't torn apart. But you get a little gray-looking downy, which is a, a, a great blue heron downy, who's somewhat shaped the same way as an eaglet and looks gray, but he doesn't have a hook beak. And that, I think, is the big distinction here. The eagle sees the hook beak on the hawk and says, I'm not going to tear that apart. That's something I'm supposed to nurture, not kill. But he sees the long beak of a duck or and he tears the head off and feeds it to his, his young eaglet. I think the other thing you have to think about too is birds of prey can be, especially as parents, can be incredibly gentle. Right. I mean, if you've ever watched these bald yeah. eagles feeding these little chicks of theirs oh. when they're so, so tiny and they're so gentle with uh, placing, the, place, placing the morsels of food in their beaks. And the other thing is, uh -huh. it wouldn't be in the eagle's best interest to grab the red-tailed hawk nestlings and then squish the heck out of them with their very strong feet and bring back this, this messy, amorphous mass. And so, uh, okay. I, I, I okay. totally agree with David. I, I think mm -hmm. that they, uh, they are well known for grabbing the, and they have this ability to decide whether to put yes. a lot of pressure on something or not and bring it in in, in, a, decent, in a, a decent format to the nest where it's young. But we know absolutely Time and time and time after time, they bring in quarry that, in those great 
sharp talons yeah. and leave it on the nest, it is not sufficiently hurt yep. that it can get up a few minutes later and run off mm -hmm. the nest and down to the ground again. Yep. So it's very common for them to bring in prey that has not been killed by those great lethal yeah. talons. Yeah, and, and there's so many good questions coming in, so I'm going to take the one from Anne-Marie at the moment. Is there any way to ban this red-tailed hawk to follow it? Well, I, as a scientist, <laughs> yes. uh, and, and David's a scientist as well, we're working together for tracking bald eagles, I would have loved to have had a climber go up there and put some sort of a, right. at the very least, mm -hmm. uh, a band on the bird's right. legs to identify it so mm -hmm. if we ever catch it again or someone sees a red-tailed hawk flying around the local neighborhood with a band on its leg, it would probably be the only one around with that mark on its leg. Even better would, would have been to put a, some sort of a satellite tracking device or a or a one up that bounces off cell towers, because we would both love to know uh, <laughs> the fate of that little guy. I mean, I w watched him yesterday, and uh, he's in very, very good health. He's uh -huh. in great health. Yeah. He's got a beautiful plumage. And what that tells me mm -hmm. is that, assuming that they probably did get a, a fair bit of a fish diet, right. which is sort of a little bit strange for a red-tailed hawk. Yes, hawk, it is. Um, it obviously mm -hmm. agreed with him, mm -hmm. the fish diet, because <laughs> he's in great shape. He's, and, and you know, this brings shape. another interesting question from Jackie here. Uh, so, will the hawk that continues to think he's an eagle, if it survives mature, to maturity, will he look for an eagle for a mate? Yeah. What an interesting well, question. I, I've studied that thing. Oh, As good. I said, it's called, okay. it's called um, imprinting. Imprinting, yes. And yes. Um, mm -hmm. in my studies, where I mm -hmm. took one falcon species, either at the egg stage or the mm -hmm. young mm -hmm. stage, and put them in the nest of others, either sometimes just alone mm -hmm. or with other siblings of its own kind, and then gave them mate choice, later, mate, mate choice tests. As I said, 50% made the wrong choice. But they made the wrong choice. Yes, right. they did. They they chose their foster species over the other one. So that oh told me goodness. that you know it's uh, probably not a, a a good idea to do cross fostering uh, with certain species. Although I do know that people have placed peregrine falcons in the nests of red-tailed hawks, and then the peregrine falcons actually bred with their own their own kind later on. So it remains to be seen what this little red-tailed hawk will do. But I, I can tell you right now he is imprinted on bald eagles as that? his own species, and it's generally irreversible. It's generally irreversible. Irre it's generally irreversible, except that the right. difference between a bald eagle and a red-tailed hawk is so immense, huge size, <laughs> uh, the white head, the, the, it just uh -huh. so different that it's very likely that uh, the red-tailed hawk might approach a bald mm -hmm. eagle um, for courtship in a couple of years when it can breed, but when it keeps getting rebuffed by that species, which it will, if not killed, um, then it'll start maybe seeking out its own kind, or it just won't ever get a mate. Uh, this is just so interesting. Another great question here from Todd coming in is what we saw recently was that the, the, the little hawk was mantling the food. Yeah. Is this a behavior that it has learned from the eagles, or is this a no, red hawk th behavior? This is a, a behavior mm -hmm. of most predatory birds. Okay. They mantle in okay. order to cover up the mm -hmm. food so another passing bird doesn't see this f the trail of feathers, this circle of feathers, which instantly tells a passing predator, ooh, <laughs> there's something there on the ground, dead that, or maybe being eaten, mm -hmm. that I can take for food. They cover it all up, and that's called mantling. And you can see this on our live cameras. The young eaglets mantle all the time to protect their food. Once they start to eat on their own, they protect their food from their sibling. Yeah. Common in all different raptors. They almost all of them mantle. Yeah. And now comes a brilliant question. What about the reverse? Now they they've watched uh, these eaglets have have grown up with with our our little hawklet. What happens to their imprint? You know, uh, is, I, this, this is no, a great. They, they'll, <laughs> they'll they'll mostly imprint on the parents. Oh, oh I see. So okay. Those three okay. eaglets are going to grow up pretty uh, much normal. normal They're not right. going to think that hey, maybe I'm a red-tailed hawk. That's not going to happen. Their, their, their stimulus is okay. so strong with the parents feeding them and their own, seeing their own kind as well. Yes. But let, let's uh -huh. come back to this little, yeah. this okay. little red-tailed hawk and, and the mantling thing. Uh -huh. um, in watching its behavior, uh -huh. the, the, besides the fact there was lots of food, mm -hmm. the other reason this guy survived, again, is this little big man complex. The mm -hmm. fact that it thinks it's an eagle. It was, it's a very aggressive bird. In fact, it did most of the begging behavior. Um, for, for those eaglets. I mean, there were, there were times when they were probably calling, but whenever I went to the nest, that little red-tailed hawk was constantly begging because uh. whenever the parents bought food in, the large eaglets usually commandeered it first. They'd grab the first chunks, and then whatever got left over, if the female male brought some more in, then the red-tailed hawk would get fed. Occasionally, it might have grabbed food out of the uh, eaglet's beaks and so on, but it basically had to be very aggressive or would never have survived. There's an interesting thing yes, back ahead, to your please. previous uh, comment yeah, about um, 
about imprinting. Mm -hmm. the, the lady is, is lumping two big scientific concepts together. One is imprinting and the other is the instinct of pre-learned behavior. Right. And things are built into the genes of, of the species which are kind of called instinctive behavior. And then there's the things that it learns okay. about imprinting, and these are usually learned in that last, or not in the last, learned in the growing up stage. Uh, here's a classic example with peregrine falcons. When they leave a cliff, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the first flight, it was determined, peregrines kind of make the flight off and they look back at the cliff. And that's a Im moment of imprinting, and that's the kind of site that they're going to return to. And this is one of the theories behind how when we started, because I was one of the first people to ever breed peregrines in captivity, we raised them on a ledge inside a building. And this further facilitated, when they flew off that ledge, they looked back and this kind of bred into them instinct of, imprinting in their brain. Where am I going to nest when I get to be an adult? And so the first birds that were released into the wild, right. they all went to buildings and nested, or many of them it's, did. It's funny you should mention this because I actually studied nest imprinting in American kestrels. Okay, there you go. American kestrels are a nest box species. Right. They nest in cavities, okay? And so um, what I did is we took some American kestrel young and we raised them on a ledge in captivity and then we gave them a choice the next year when they were able to breed mm -hmm. to, to nest in a nest box which they would no, normally do or nest on the ledge where they were raised okay this counters actually again conflicts with what David just said but this is what I found in kestrels and when I gave them a choice they chose the nest box every time they did not chose uh, they did not choose the, the type of place that they were raised in. That's with kestrels, though. I'm not going to say it's the same with peregrines or anything else. Well, there, there are many questions coming in related to this now. Uh, uh, David made the distinction between instinct and imprint. Yes. And, and a question that relates to that is really then the urbanization, the behavior of such. One said, our little hawk seems to be very, very friendly to humans, coming very close now. I think you told me last night uh, about that, or you don't agree, but let's hear what David has to say to that. Is that now a change in behavior we see in raptors, and what, what would that mean for ra uh, raptor interaction of different species and so on? Oh, I think historically most raptors have been conditioned for a hundred years, or perhaps even longer. I mean, really, in the history of raptors on other continents, a thousand years. But in North America, there was a up until the 1960s, mid-60s, all the raptors were considered vermin. They were considered to be competitors to humans. I mean, the eagle for fish, uh, a red tail perhaps for a rabbit, uh, uh, an osprey for fish, the, the orcas, the, the, the killer whales for, for fish, and so on. Anything that competed with us was given the category vermin, and they were, with, the humans were at will to kill them and encouraged to kill them and to sell ammunition and guns and scopes. We, that all changed in, in the mid 60s when we began to see that so many of the top predators were simply dying out as were a lot of the creatures below them. But it was easier to go out and assess the few predators and count them at the top mm -hmm. of the food chain. So predators all of a sudden went from being despised vermin to being the iconic savior of defining the health of the ecosystem under, underneath it. And what has happened in the last 50, 60 years, raptors, which when I was young and, and in the 50s trying to get close to eagles to film them, we couldn't get within 300 meters, yards of, of, of an eagle. They were so terrified of people. Now, you know, I've got 400 pairs nesting just right here in my valley. 400 pairs across from here to Vancouver. They are in every park, almost every park and golf course and uh, in people's backyard. They have adapted mm -hmm. so effectively and red tails are even as common. Red tails are slightly more secretive than eagles because they're smaller and they can fit into the crowns and into trees where people don't see the nest. Okay. Eagles nest at 8, 10, 12 feet across are a pretty conspicuous component of the neighborhood. So people have learned that they're there, you can see them, and the eagles have learned back that people aren't going to kill them. So we've got had nests that were 33 feet 
above people and they're producing young. I mean, they it's their adaptation to all this disturbance that's the, the, the wondrous thing. They have come to trust us almost better than we've come to understand or trust them because they, the, they've given us credit. Once we quit shooting the yeah. creatures, they've moved in closer and closer. Yeah. And it's kind of a wondrous relationship. Yeah, it, it's very true what David says about, about the, the urbanization of birds of prey. There are many species now nesting in suburban and urban centers all around the world. Peregrine falcons are, are one of them. But I wouldn't, I'd hesitate to put the word friendlier around humans in front of that red-tailed hawk because yeah. um, that red-tailed red hawk is still a wild bird. And I can tell you from experience in climbing into skyscraper nests with peregrine falcons that they will do their utmost to drive oh, yeah. anybody intruding in the nest off. They'll attack you. I've been hit by them. People will be right. hit in the head by them and so on. So um, if you went near a red-tailed hawk nest, uh, you'd get the same kind of reception or whatever. Not to say that, though, that David is right in that mm -hmm. uh, all birds of prey that are now nesting in these city centers and so on are definitely more comfortable okay, around yeah. people. Uh, yeah, they, they've accepted us as not being somebody with a shotgun in their hands okay, or whatever. And so, okay, and it brings yeah. a very interesting yeah. question from Heather. Maybe another hawk pursuing this hawk would change its imprint as a mate. And then, of course, my additional question to that, would it make any difference whether our little hawk that is a male or a female in its behavior could that, you know, could that have I'm, I'm not aware that, uh, that there's a, a sexual difference in okay. the imprinting thing. Okay. What I did learn from my imprinting studies that I did, um, and it wasn't, it, was, no, it wasn't just mate choice for cross-fostered species, it was also mate choice tests between, um, mm -hmm. between uh, a, a male um, who had parasites and one who didn't and so on, or one that was its own brother versus a strange one. And the kestrel females, who mm -hmm. do, usually do the selection, generally will, will take in the end, they'll select the male who tries the hardest. And um, accepting the fact that this little red-tailed hawk is likely a male, I had a good look at it yesterday, yeah, I think, I and think I'm pretty so sure it's a male just by, uh, it's a slightly smaller size than the female, that's common in birds of prey, in diurnal birds of prey. And secondly, um, in a male like that, usually the head is a, more of a sculpted thing with the, with the body, like the shoulder area. In other words, it's more distinct on the body, sort of like the same way owls, you can sex them that way great horned owls, and so I think we're in agreement that this guy is likely a male. If people want to call him Stephen, uh, Stephen Hawking, that's fine. <laughs> but um, bottom line is, is that um, since it's a male, it will be the one that will set up a territory somewhere or take over a territory from another male, and it will display, mm -hmm. and a female will come in, and uh, it will present okay. food to it and, and maybe show it different places to nest and then eventually they'll build a nest together. And here's a very relevant question from Judith actually about the rehab centers. Can rehab experts actually help with the imprint problem for future mating stabilization and so on? Well, Is there any comment on that? Th there's a chance, uh, so and correct. actually in this case with, with Hocklet or Stephen or whatever, yeah. I'm a great hope that he will actually be captured quickly. All right. Because I don't think allowing his instinctive things that he's now, or the um, imprinted behaviors that he's now got are going to bode well for him. So I think he's better off to be brought into captivity and I think there could be a retraining process, a reconditioning, however you want to call it. If he was to put in, put into a big flight cage, he could be uh, released voles and mice and he could learn to hunt things in the grass. Uh -huh. okay. that, that, and, that, and that's a really important thing. And that, But wait a minute, then there's one other aspect. He could be put into a pen where there's also red-tailed hawks with him and he'd learn to associate with red-tailed hawks in the same pen and this might help equalize <laughs> him to something of two to three pounds instead of ten to twelve pounds, which is not a good relationship. And yet I, Professor Bird is well, shaking his head. I'm shaking my head Why? only because I, I know for a fact that imprinting is usually an irreversible thing. But there have been cases, because I had an imprinted female peregrine many years ago who uh, I thought was never going to breed. And suddenly one year she did breed with a male and, and laid eggs. So, uh, and I've had people raise, hand-raise broadwing hawks in their backyard. This is a smaller version of a red-tailed hawk in the east. And I told them, I said, look at you're hand-raising this bird, you're going to let it go don't expect it to breed, it's going to be imprinted on, on humans and so on. But then the bird, which was banded, did come back and breed normally. So it is possible this little guy could come back. As far as catching it, um, I think that would be a very controversial thing to do. I think that okay. there would be a lot of people upset. There's a lot of people who, uh, 
who have emotional attachments to wildlife or whatever who would be very upset with this. But what David's saying, that if it was brought in captivity yeah. and kept in a large flight cage with some other red-tailed hawks, then it's, it's very possible that that could override the, uh, its imprinting on bald eagles. Because there's such a difference between uh, the bald eagles and the red-tailed hawks. It's not like they're two very closely related species. They're so different. Mm -hmm. And so, it, but I, I wouldn't recommend it personally only because I know it would upset a lot of people if we caught it. But the same reason why we didn't hire someone to go up there and put a transmitter or put a band on the, on the bird is that uh, the public has, gained, has created, uh, has developed an emotional attachment to this bird. Yes. It's a famous bird now, <laughs> and to mess around with it in any way would just be an invite a lot of criticism. Yeah. I, and and mm -hmm. then, so I want to clarify that because I, I'm assuming that it's going to have great difficulty. Mm -hmm. It has not been taught to catch voles or mice or rabbits and so on. So I think it's going to get into difficulty in finding food. It, it, literally, I suspect it will starve to death if it doesn't get nailed by one of its siblings, which it doesn't seem to. It seems to have come up with an incredible relationship there. But that relationship won't carry forward to another bald eagle. So at some point, it's likely to be predated. Anybody who's ever raised and hunted with birds of prey knows that eagles are the big, big predator on falcons and red tails that when you're out hunting with your trained bird, the big danger is an eagle is going to take your bird and kill it. So it's, it's almost inevitable, inevitable that that little red tail will be, will be predated by some other eagle. Yeah. So my hope is, and that's why I'm saying hope, is as he begins to starve to death, which I suspect he will do, okay. that somebody gets to grab him in those stages and at that point he's he qualifies logically to be saved and rescued and taken to a rehab center in which case then you will find that he'll get opportunities to maybe learn some hunting techniques also if he then associates with other red tails yeah. this whole thing might readjust his life because the imprinting is is definitely different in every species i have as you know, I have lots of cranes outside, and I raise a lot of cranes. And if you read the literature, they imprint. And if you hand rear them, that's it. They will only breed. They only want to breed with people. They don't want to breed. Well, that's not true at all. I mean, I, I have very imprinted cranes, and then you turn around and they all bow for us to get mated. You put them with another male, and I've never had a crane that didn't breed, okay, but even here, when they're imprinted. But so good, yeah, every very, species is different. A okay, very good question from from MJ. How does he, mean probably David Hancock, know that the hawk hasn't caught a mouse yet? Because I actually have to agree with it. I did see it in some front garden on the beach, you know, uh, digging around. How, you know, how would you know? Well, okay. let, let me answer. Let me, let okay, me take go this ahead. <laughs> this little hawk has basically got one thing in its favor and one thing against its okay. favor. But one thing in its favor is that red-tailed hawks are very opportunistic feeders. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, and, um, and so... Um, mm -hmm. I think that this guy, as he gets hungry, like all birds of prey do when they leave the nest, they start chasing after things, mm -hmm. okay? They, they're hungry, so they start chasing after things because mom and dad have stopped providing food to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they grab something, it could be a, a, a young rabbit, bingo, they'll add that to its dietary list and say, oh, that tasted good, I'll get another one of those. And there are a lot of rabbits around in the neighborhood. I, I've got tons of them in my own, in my right, own street. Right, right, and right. so there's that, there's that mm -hmm. uh, food item. And then there's... Even stuff along the beach is not, is, it may not be a problem for this guy, not because he saw where the food came from, it's just that he seems to be very versatile in his habits. That is in his favor. What's in his, not in his favor is what David has just said. He is very comfortable around bald eagles because he's been raised among them, which means he's not going to be very fearful of them. Right. And as we said at the very beginning of this podcast, that bald eagles and red-tailed hawks historically hate each other. And so if he goes around another bald eagle that had nothing to do with him, not one of his siblings, not one of his parents, and puts himself in harm's way, mm -hmm. then he'll very quickly get taken out by a bald eagle. And, and that's probably the, 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 probably the most likely fate of this guy. Yeah, David, this is a question by, ta uh, by, by several here. Yeah. Um, Tina asked, if he gets with red-tailed hawks, will they accept him? He's obviously different. Would they realize this? A good question. Well, it is a very good question. The thing <laughs> is, it all comes down to the imprinting thing that, that um, because he thinks he's a bald eagle, uh -huh. uh, but there are, as David has said before, there's mm -hmm. instinctive behaviors before. Right. He has genes for, mm -hmm. uh, he's, he, he's carrying genes from his parents mm -hmm. that basically um, tell him how to go about courtship duties mm -hmm. and everything else. Right. So 
Um, it, it'll all be a matter of whether he's interested in them or not and recognize them as a potential mate. So um, I'd have to say right now that he probably won't because he's imprinted on bald eagles. He probably will not recognize a red-tailed hawk yeah, as other, a potential mate. Other red-tailed hawks are probably going to think he's a red-tailed hawk. The challenge is what will his relationship be to a red tail? That's going to be a right. good, good question. Yeah, and Karen good, has an interesting question of Karen Bills, or Karen Bills oh, from Hancock yeah, Wildlife. My, my project coordinator. Yes. Hi, Karen. <laughs> so, Karen, uh, some neighbors have reported seeing Spunky, oh, that's probably how you pronounce it. Another, another name? name? Yeah, another <laughs> name for Stephen Hawkins. <laughs> kill a couple of birds. Will hawks kill other birds? Have, well, of course. I've they've, seen, they've seen hawks that kill other that's, birds? That's what yeah. I'm reading here, yes. Well, I was told that the bird had been seen hanging around bird feeders or whatever, and oh, if right. there's a dove, like mm -hmm. morning doves, for example, or not morning right, doves, they're right. not here, but a dove species or a pigeon species, sometimes they're pretty unaware. But there's a lot of them uh, fledging from nests right now, and so um, a red-tailed hawk, is, that's perfectly uh, a, a fair game for a red-tailed hawk as a bird. I mean, it's not one of their top things, because they're not agile, agile, agile enough to to catch smaller birds, but anything that's kind of uh, you know, it's it's a matter of, of uh, you know the weakest and the and the, and the sick don't make it because they get uh, preyed upon by by predators. So. And that relates yeah. back to that last question the guy had about would it learn to hunt less? Yes. Yes. And, yes. And, and there's this balance here, and I, I'm sure this is where this uh, chap was going, and it's the balance that we are all concerned with. We want to give the creature a chance to have a go at making a life. Yes. The question is, will he learn to hunt mice or s s leftover things at right. bird right. feeders in time to not keep diminishing in his weight? Yeah. He's going right. to meet this incredible challenge over the next week, Can't, particularly as soon as the eagles abandon him because they're about to go off on migration and it's not likely he's going to go with them because the parents will leave a week yeah. before the young do. So he'll be left around there not knowing what to do. So the balance will be, can he learn to scavenge or hunt things quickly enough yeah. or is he going to slowly starve to death and then you get to this place where he's barely walking and that's yeah. when somebody is likely to get him. He's in the point of starving to death. That's the time you hope you pick him up between nearly dead and dead yeah. and you take him to a rehab center. It's only a very small window of nearly dead and dead when yeah. people can likely grab him safely and or likely even grab him because he right. wouldn't be available. And that's when yeah. things go to the rehab center well, or he what, flies into a window. But, but some red tails have known to migrate, right? Is oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do. But uh, whether but, this guy, we don't know what no, the okay. migratory habits are of the red tail hawks that live in a very, okay. a very a mild okay. climate like mm -hmm. we have in Victoria, right. San Spencer. But, but David has raised a good point in that uh, when a bird of prey fledges from a nest, whether it's an eagle or whether it's a red-tailed hawk or a peregrine falcon, that is the most dangerous time for them when they leave the nest because usually the parents of uh, their, their, their natural parents will bring in enough food for them to uh, keep them going and sustain them while they learn how to hunt for themselves. Okay, And there have been cases, for example, where parents have actually taught their young to to, to hunt. It doesn't happen very often. I mean, I've known cases of peregrine falcon um, adults dropping food out of the uh, sky for their youngsters to grab, to, you know, to teach them how to, how to grab prey in the air and so on. But I'm, I'm not aware that red-tailed hawk parents teach their young. But, but well, what they, they're going to get, he's going to get food from the parents, mm -hmm. uh, from these parent eagles up to a certain extent. But once that dries up, hopefully he'll have developed enough skills mm -hmm. to find some sort of food supply, whether it's rabbits, birds or more fish or whatever, hopefully he's developed that in time. But if he doesn't, as David said, he'll get weaker and weaker and then that's when he'll be yes. most vulnerable to getting nailed by a red-tailed hawk or a, a, a bald eagle or something else. So, okay. yeah, the, the big question here is, and I know people are really concerned with giving him a chance. That's, yes. that's a key level. Mm -hmm. Let him have a chance. And so that chance is that difference between how quickly mm -hmm. Can he learn to catch food? Now the challenge here is, bald um, red-tailed hawks generally follow the the young follow the parents around for four or five, even six weeks, following, watching, getting, in a sense, lessons. That doesn't really happen with wilderness eagles. It may happen for a few days around a nest with a bald eagle mm -hmm. getting food on the nearby shoreline, and the and the juvenile eagle seeing it. 
But usually, once they attack the parent on the ground, uh, 500 yards or whatever it is, when they see them eating and sitting on a fish on the rock somewhere, and if a juvenile attacks them, that's the, that's the key. Right, right then and there, when the next day, the adults will have abandoned their chicks. It's not a big period of teaching mm -hmm. from the eagles, but there's quite a big mm -hmm. period of teaching mm -hmm. with hawks, and that's going to play a negative effect on him. He's oh, 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 okay, I, I, just a quick question from Bob, because could this happen again with other birds regarding imprinting? That seems to be a big thing with imprinting. That bald eagles raises an osprey, for example. Oh, well, the same, the same, same thing, thing could potentially exactly happen, same. although I've never so. heard of a bald eagle raising really? an osprey. I mean, I've never heard of that in the scientific literature. I, I know a lot of osprey biologists, they study ospreys all their mm -hmm. lives, mm -hmm. and no one has ever told me about a case, case. where an osprey was raised by a bald yeah. eagle or I vice versa. I haven't heard of that. Would, uh, that I just don't think that would happen. I, I think the thing is, is that ospreys um, are a fairly large raptor, and uh, and I know when we had a drone hovering over an osprey nest <laughs> right. in Montana to take pictures of it. The two ospreys that were uh -huh. didn't like the drone at all. They hate drones. Left the drone above their nest to go and attack a bald eagle that was a mile away because they basically um, are habitually uh, in uh, have a, a sort of a hatred for bald eagles because they potentially could take their young or whatever. They're, they're nest predators. This is an interesting question. Uh, from Elle, I also videoed him, so she... she uh, yeah, this yeah. is Elle. Hi, Elle, one of our yeah, yeah. Uh, she's, Hancock Wildlife Foundation devoted exactly, followers. Exactly, exactly. And she's, uh, she, she's obviously doing a lot of good photography and observations here. She said, I videoed him stripping bark of a twig. Was this practice for future prey? Why, do, why would they do this? Um, mm. I, I have heard of that sort mm. of behavior. Okay. There have been, um, there have been documenta mm -hmm. has been documentation of uh, hawks in a nest mm -hmm. um, having green inside their on their tongues right, or whatever that right. presumably is chlorophyll from le eating leaves or whatever. Right. I'm not sure why they do that. Whether uh, they they get some sort right. of a uh, you know a, a vitamin or mineral thing right. from that or whether um, it's something to do with parasites. I don't know. Or same, just same just play. It just could be play behavior okay. as well. Yeah. Let me add yeah, sure. to that. I mean, eagles claws, mm -hmm. talons. Hawk claws and talons and eagle beaks and the, these are growing all the time and it's it's one of these instinctive behaviors you have to keep tearing at things because if you read keep a bird of prey in yeah. captivity and feed it just soft tender food my goodness the beak will hook right around and grow up and under oh, its chin it's a good point and that's and great. so they have built into them exercising and tearing all the time to keep that beak worn down. And eagles, which are eating, tending to eat soft food, are often tearing at branches. Our oh, pair right. of eagles that nested on our cameras at what we call the Lafarge Nest in downtown Vancouver, they completely ringed uh -huh. and tore the, the cambium layer, the bark and the cambium layer, off every branch that they could reach. And I think it's all part of what is called coping, C-O-P-I-N-G. Right, coping. You, and okay. A, okay. a falconer copes the beak and you take a knife and you pare it down because you've got to keep up mm -hmm. with the rate of growth. And eagles are doing this by pulling at bones. And mm -hmm. if you're a soft fish eater, yeah. mm -hmm. you've got to do something else because you've got to keep wearing this this beak down. I, I, I agree. I think that's the most plausible explanation for yeah. the red tail hawk doing that. But you know something? the In an ideal world, it would be great if we could get permission to capture the red-tailed right. hawk and bring it to a, a good rehab right. facility to give it a chance. But it's not an ideal world. The fact is, is that it'll be a very controversial thing to do. <laughs> half the people will be in favor of it, and the other half will be up in arms saying, why are you interfering with this poor little hawk and so on. And so I don't know if we're going to be able to do anything like that. No, no. I, 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 I agree with David, except that. Yeah. The only time anybody's going to be able to, we're, nobody's going to go out and try and catch the bird, but the time that they can run it, easily run it down, is because it is so weak and, and yeah. ill. Yeah. And then it's kind of an obligation. You no. run it down and you grab it and you take it. We've already, everybody in the region of, of our Sydney nest has the phone number yeah. of Wild Ark. And Wild, Wild Ark, Ark is the big rehab center right in Victoria. And they won't keep the bird. Right. But they will look after it initially, and then they'll get it either to Owl, which is over here in the Fraser Delta, where they have the big flight cages and training facilities for these raptors, or they'll send it up to one in Duncan. Yes. So they'll do one or the other. Both places are very capable of 
not just looking after it, but yeah. reconditioning this bird. Because that's, I think, the kind of key here. If it is captured because it's very weak and dying. And that's very acceptable. They, yeah, that's very acceptable. That's very acceptable. It's not, that's not a controversial item. I agree. Um, about anybody who cares. That's, that's, a, that's a must. That's a must. Yeah. And so we'll get it and it'll get taken to one of these facilities that's been set up to then care for these. Sometimes they're injured, they've hit cars, windows, or in this case, maybe starving. But won't we be surprised, though, if that doesn't happen because this little guy yeah. managed to find enough food in his... Whoa, uh, wonderful. Uh, that, I mean, we're all hoping for that. That's what own. we're hoping for. Can, can he make it? Can he adapt to a new circumstance? Can he get to find enough... How to develop a technique to hunt voles and mice and rabbits? Yeah. Wow. We're all hoping he'll do that. So what's your prediction for the next two weeks and for the month ahead? Well, I, 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 we go. I, I think, well, I'm going to let David answer that because he, know, he knows the, the, uh, how uh, bald eagles, um, mm -hmm. adults, uh, how, how they deal mm -hmm. with their young when they fledge from the nest. So I'm going to let him deal with that. Well, the projections are ones of hope. <laughs> I mean, it, it, my, my projections have never been, uh, they're always wanting to be optimistic. But knowing what he's up against, and he's imprinting to the wrong species, and particularly one that is so different, I mean, two pounds to something that's 12 pounds, this, is, this does not bode well for the future. I know, since eagles largely predate red tail and kill adult red tail hawks, that his future is not good. He's far better off going through this stage, in my, in my opinion, far better off um, being taken into, at some point, into a rehab center and reconditioned both to hunt properly and, and to yeah. acquaint himself more in, mm -hmm. in greater intensity with other red tails because he's got to learn that eagles are not his friends. They are his enemy. They will just kill him um, if it's not his siblings. Yeah. But isn't it possible that with the, all, uh, with the urbanization, and David, you've seen this over many years, David Hancock, you've seen this over, over decades, that the nests are getting closer together, isn't it possible that maybe red-tailed hawks and eagles will change the behavior, the way they, they interact with each other? Is that a possibility? Well, I think they're much more uh, tolerant probably today than, than they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's hardly a bald eagle nest in the mm -hmm. Fraser Valley that doesn't have a red-tailed hawk nesting within two, three, four hundred yards. I mean, they're everywhere, these two species coexist. They normally eat totally different things, with the exception of some scavenged road kills. A dead bunny on the road is competitively sought by the eagle, or it's competitively scavenged also by, by a red tail. There, are, there is an overlap, but generally speaking, they have learned to coexist. And at that same time, the eagle will eat red tail. I mean, I have witnessed them eating red tails. Now, this that, is that not will, that um, will always no. be there. That will always be there. The fact that bald eagles are bigger and if they They're can bigger. catch a red tail hawk, they, they will. will eat they it. will do it. So these birds will never become friends with each other, but as David said, because of urbanization and because these birds are getting forced to nest closer together, <laughs> they are tolerating each other more than they did in the in the past. I want to add uh -huh. one more thing to that. Forced. Uh -huh. Go ahead. When I've studied the eagles in the wilderness areas all up and down the west coast, it's kind of an average with one young per nest mm -hmm. when they're successful. But in our urban areas, in the, in the towns and across this valley right here, where we've carved up the habitat into so many different patterns and ditches and so on, we've actually increased the productivity of much of this land mm -hmm. in terms of producing the food that these two species want, mm -hmm. red tails and bald eagles, in particular bald eagles when you get closer to the coast, we have produced more food for them than is available in the wilderness area. We That's go. why we have this much higher density, but more than just the density, we've got most of the nests are producing too young. And, and following over a thousand nests in the wilderness, I only ever have one nest that produced three young. Right. And a thousand nests. Well, it's, you know, it's 15, 20 percent of our nests here produce three young. The town, the urban area, is much, much more productive mm -hmm. for eagles. And 
and they produce more young as a result, and then we produce many red tails the yeah. same way. And I, I have an interesting question myself because a few days ago I published a video that actually shows our, our, our little um, hawklet racing, and someone put the analogy to a football team, you know, the, 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 the small people, right through the eaglets, <laughs> grabbing the food, and yep. I put it in slow yep. motion, the yep. whole thing, and there was a lot of controversy, because I put the title there, and like your opinion, initially I put the title there, and, and said, risking his life, and some people said, ah, you're just going for clicks here, um, this is absolute nonsense. I really thought that at that moment, he was risking his life, because he was racing right between the eaglets, and I was just thinking, well, one of them could just put his uh, talent down, that would be the end of our little hobbit. Or do you think, no, that wasn't such a big risk well, for our Well, I was watching them yesterday Tell me. at the nest, yeah. and the parent brought in some food, and yeah. one of the eaglets immediately grabbed that food item, so the little red tail basically stayed there and kept begging and begging. Right. So then another adult, it could have been the same uh -huh. one, brought in another prey item, and the red, red tail this time mm -hmm. actually dove right in and the eaglet and the red-tailed hawk actually all sort of footed each other. Wow. Uh, they grabbed wow. each other and so on. Uh -huh. it, it's always possible that during an incident like that, that the eaglet could, you know, happen to put its talons in a, in a more lethal place or whatever, or wound the, 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 the red tail. So it that, is, that is it a is, possibility. It's so, risking yeah, well, yeah, Any time you've got a bunch of birds, yeah. <laughs> um, because we do know that, that um, bald right. eagles in the nest, sometimes one will kill the other like as in many bird species. Okay. So there's always a risk mm -hmm. when birds are hungry yeah. and they want yeah. food and yeah. so on, yeah. with these sharp talons, these sharp beaks, that one could make a, a, an unfortunate blow to the other and then cause some problems. And when the red tail is much smaller than the bald eagle, the problems could be even worse. The David, key, yes. well, the key yes. here is, is really about the availability of food and the level of hunger in yes. the individual. Yes. Yes. I mean, if, if Mm -hmm. The habitat around them, or the pair, mm -hmm. the adult pair in particular, don't mm -hmm. bring in enough food. Right. The likelihood of increasing the sibling rivalry to yeah. fight over what minimum mm -hmm. amount is there. Yeah. This is kind of a fundamental theory in in raising birds, uh, birds of prey. Particularly, it's mm -hmm. so apparent in some of the owls, like the Arctic owl. The Arctic snow owl will lay ten eggs, mm -hmm. and in bad years it might raise none. But some Poor years of voles, the food, main food supply being there, mm -hmm. they may raise, in poor years, they may raise one young. In the areas, in the years when there's a great amount of food, maybe all six, seven, eight, nine of the eggs will hatch and fledge. Mm -hmm. It's about this balance between food being available and a little chick being able to muster up enough courage and ability to, to beg for it or, or go after it, and the others not aggressively over compete with him so he has a chance and that's that's what's been so marvelous about this little guy he's got the chutzpah to go out after food which we've yeah. seen in the early years and that was aided and abetted mm -hmm. or he got away with his chutzpah because the big kids in the nest the 10 12 pound yes. siblings simply were not so hungry that they demanded the food or him because that was <laughs> that was the question to start with. Are this pair of eagles, the adults, productive enough and the habitat productive enough to satisfy the needs of three huge eagles plus another red tail? If it got competitive, who's going to lose? Well, it's pretty, uh, pretty obvious who's going to lose this game. The question that I get asked the most about this is in my 45 years of experience, okay. where, does this, where does this phenomenon rank? In terms of yeah, that's uh, a good that's a good you know, point. Where does it rank? It's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in birds of prey. Okay, so that's a very years. clear answer. It's a it's very very uh, unusual thing. I've really enjoyed watching or whatever. But you know something, I, I, as we see more and more birds of prey come into cities mm -hmm. and and humans interact with them more, like that nest in Sydney, for example, is now famous, mm -hmm. and many people in the neighborhood have kind of adopted it as their mm -hmm. own. Then, with so many eyes watching the, these mm -hmm. birds. We're now learning a lot of things that we didn't know about them before. Right, For example, right, right. in Montreal, we had a, a mm -hmm. little female peregrine falcon raised in a nest box on a building on a, one of the university campuses okay. downtown. Okay. And that bird uh, didn't leave the nest in, in the nest area. It stayed with mom and dad mm -hmm. for the next breeding season and actually tried to become the, mm -hmm. the incubator of the eggs laid by her mother. Wow. But it gets it gets stranger. We That's published incredible. It. it. But it gets stranger. Really? This bird also was had a deformity. Mm -hmm. Its leg was sticking straight out like this permanently. 
So, but it, it developed an ability to catch pigeons. It became a really good pigeon what? killer with its legs sticking up like this, and the bird is still alive today. And that's not the strangest thing. What it did <laughs> is it went to another territory eventually, in a couple right. of years, uh -huh. and it's mated with its own brother from the same nest, the incest. That's so incredible. You, this is something that I never would have thought would have happened in Birds of Prey, but because now we're watching these things with webcams and everything else, right. and now we're learning all kinds of very interesting behaviors that... You know, who, we never would have believed them. Who, who knew that birds cheated on one another until we developed DNA fingerprinting and could take blood samples and feather samples from birds and do DNA tests to, to, to see, you know, who the, the parents were of the eggs in the nest. So that, that's a really interesting question. How much do we really know about red-tailed hawks? I mean, play, well, how much do we really know? There's a lot. Well, we, we don't even know the behavior of the red-tailed hawks in the Sydney area, whether they migrate or not. He may stay there year-round. You know what it would be interesting to do is to take a really good look, take some good photographs of that bird, and see if there's any kind of uh, markings on Arrives. that bird that might distinct yeah, the, that's what they the, the, the you know, might, might distinguish him yes. from other red-tailed hawks because we can't you know catch the bird. What, the, what the, about the call? Because I've recorded the call very yeah. well, you know, with a good microphone. Yeah. Do you, will the call change? Yeah. The I've, pitch change? I've studied oh. that in Kestrels oh, as tell well. Tell me, tell me. And um, <laughs> we didn't publish it, but uh, okay. it, it, it is well known that. Yeah that um, uh, within a, a, a given nest of birds, for example, each one can have a kind of its own distinctive um, call signature, whatever, slightly differing if you were to tape it and then analyze it. I'm not saying that would be the case for red-tailed hawks, but um, certainly we did find some differences in individuals with kestrels. Interesting, interesting. And one of the funny <laughs> things, one of the people yes. who lives below that nest is yes. Leslie. Okay. One of our contributors, okay. and Leslie can imitate the sounds of both the hawklet okay, and the eaglet well. so well that they all look and follow. Uh -huh. And certainly, the yeah. bird watchers mm -hmm. all take their cameras rushing over to photograph this little hawklet, and they find, oh, it was Leslie. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, so, so being able to analyze sounds. Yeah. It, it will take a, a, a more sensitive person than a lot of us oh, because oh, okay, but anyway, we've, we've been going on for uh, for um, one more than one hour. It's incredible. Sorry, yeah. no, not sorry. I think the interest is incredibly high. Oh, I've enjoyed it. On and on. But people are really grateful to both of you. Oh, thank you. I mean, you've you've. Uh, uh, I think the wealth of information you've just delivered is incredible and very very valuable. And I mean, this is going to this story is going to go on. Uh, just one quick question uh, because. The, Everybody always asks, what's the, what's the health of the hawk? I think maybe you can just comment what was well, the last Le scene. Well, Leslie phoned yes. me last night, yes. and the bird had a wonderful day yesterday. He was literally playing games and running from one house roof to the other, to the next, and back, and up into the branches, um, moving from one branch to the other. He's incredibly mm -hmm. active. He went back to the nest to get fed. Mm -hmm. Adults will not come and bring him food. There's absolutely, uh, The eagles won't. So he knows enough to go to the the food. Now, the big trick is, will he get on to catching something? Because they're going to be leaving within about two weeks from now, or ten days from now. That's the next weeks. challenge. It's the next challenge. And yeah. we, we, I mean, everybody wants to wish him well, <laughs> and we yeah. put in place a safeguard. Right. And that safeguard is everybody knows if they pick him up starving to death or hurt, yes. take him to Wild Ark, yeah. and, and he'll go to one of the other bigger rehab centers and, for reconditioning. When I saw him yesterday, for example, he's as normal looking and as healthy looking as any red tailed hawk yeah. young I've ever seen. It's just that he's a little different, that he's a little screwed up in the head because he was raised <laughs> by bald eagles. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it's been rather successful and uh, the story continues. Okay. And the story continues also on all the Hancock <laughs> Wildlife streaming live cams, which are looking yes. into three bald eagle nests as we as, speak. As we um, yesterday, one of them had an eaglet that flew, well, the day before another one did, and in a few days, uh, another nest will. So if they want to see more about live predators in nests, go to HancockWildlife.org and look for our streaming cam. The eagles are there uh, on many sites, plus we lead you into another hundred nests oh, of other people around North America. And as a founding director of the Hancock Wildlife Foundation, David and I would love to thank all of the people who donate yeah. to the Hancock Wildlife Foundation, not just funds and so on, but all of their time, their observations and so on. We thank you very much. You're just as much a part of this picture as we are. 
And I, yes, and I also want to take the, the remind me, I forgot to thank all the people who came to our Fledge Fest at our place here on Saturday. And so it Sorry, was I missed one, it. <laughs> yeah, he missed it because he was coming back from Ireland. Um, but, but we want to thank them all for their donations, their support. Uh, you initiated a live auction, which we haven't quite resolved it all yet because we thought everybody was going to pick these big prints up frame things up and take them home with them. <laughs> now we've got people all over North America expecting us to figure out how to ship and them something to... that's fragile. Yeah. But we're working on that. We're okay. working on that. But So thank you all the followers yes. for, for supporting the Hancock Wildlife Foundation and particularly thank those who came out to our, our Fledge Fest. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. We're done. <laughs>